Hello there. Welcome to another Mixed Martial Arts Conversation for Sky Sports. Looking ahead to Bellator 253, AJ McKee against Darian Coldwell in the semi-final of the Featherweight Grand Prix. Very pleased to say former MMA fighter at middleweight, light heavy and heavyweight. Now a superb analyst that will be part of the Sky Sports coverage in the early hours of Friday morning UK time. The one and only Chael Sonnen. Chael, welcome back to Sky Sports YouTube. How are you? Good to be here. I'm doing great, man. I'm a little bored, I got to tell you. I'm out here in a quarantine, and I've watched every TV show there is. But other than that, I'm going to be talking to you. Yeah, you're not alone, I think, in this in this global pandemic with that. We want, to, we want to talk to you, of course, about the upcoming event, Bellator 253. But just reflect for a moment with us on Patricio Pitbull's win last week. I know you were unequivocal that he is the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in Bellator right now. But there's a debate sprung up online, of course. He thinks he's the best 145-pounder in the world. Uh, including the UFC options. That's caused a bit of a debate with people mentioning Max Holloway, not the UFC champion. Volkanovski is the man who could beat Pitbull. What's your take on, on that debate? Well, I think it's fun. I mean, look, Pitbull's got a, a, a lot of strength in his argument when Pitbull is the one willing to go and compete with the other guys, right? I mean, Pitbull is anybody. Bring him over here or send me over, however you want to do it. Um, I think that that adds a little validity. And in all fairness, I mean, he's not just beating guys. He's destroying guys. There's nobody that's close to him. I, I don't know what the blueprint to beat Pitbull was or is. Mm. If, if I'm coaching a guy, let's say, and he's got to take on Pitbull, I don't know what our strategy would be. I, I, the guy doesn't have any holes anywhere that I've ever seen exposed. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think um, Josh Thompson made the, the point on his, his weighing in podcast that actually you can't compare him to Max Holloway because the UFC people want to say that that was an erroneous victory that Volkanovski got over Holloway, but you have to compare him to the, the champion, I suppose. Sure. I like the debate of, of Holloway versus Volkanovski. Those guys fought twice. I thought Max won both of those fights. That was just my opinion. The second fight was more clear. I thought that was three rounds to two. I mean, that's mm. a fun argument if you want to have, but we are being a little bit disrespectful. I mean, Volkanovski did everything he was asked to do, and he lived with the result. I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, how long we want to continue to, to, to put a dark cloud over his, uh, you know, his career. <laughs> At some point, we got to admit, it's pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I think in, in combat sports, you have to move on, don't you? Whatever the, the decision. And what about this one coming up? A.G. made McKee against Darian Caldwell. Uh, McKee going into the contest 16 I oh, know. He's got a Bellator record for the most consecutive victories. How impressed have you been by his rise? Okay, I, I've been blown away. He's a second-generation guy. His, his pops mm. is a fighter. You know, so I, I think Floyd Mayweather would be a great example. But when you grow up and your coach is straight across the hallway – you just have more access. You have more access to training. I mean, those guys move the coffee table out of the way when he's seven years old and they start working on these kinds of techniques. So it, he's another one where, you know, we don't know what the ceiling is. And what mm. is so impressive with McKee is he keeps getting better. A lot of times we'll see this, particularly with a young athlete who gets a little bit of money, gets a, you know, a little bit of fame, and all of a sudden he gets distracted. He starts mm. doing other things or, or he starts resting on his laurels. McKee is getting better. And the only way you can do that is to be focused and be driven and to be in the practice room. And I, I think that he deserves a lot of credit for, uh, you know, how much he has kept his eye on the ball. I have to tell you, though, uh, he's the perfect kind of fight for Caldwell. I mean, Caldwell loves a match when Caldwell is the underdog. Caldwell is mm. responsible for what is known as the biggest upset in NCAA wrestling history. And I only bring to you that match because when Caldwell is counted out, there's something about that that alleviates a pressure and ups a motivation. And within an athlete's mind, some guys like to be the favorite and they like to be praised, and some guys like to be the underdog. Caldwell likes to be the underdog. He is the underdog, but I only present for you, he's going to, he's going to compete very well with AJ. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mention his dad, McKee, Antonio McKee, because he's talked about how going into this, AJ says, having his dad there without a crowd will give him a new advantage because he can listen to the subtlety of his tone and the codes and the instruction. Could that be significant? Is that something you've observed now, that the, how important those uh, instructions are without the noise of a crowd? I think AJ is probably being sweet. He's probably paying a respect to his father. No, I, I mean, the, the reality is if his dad didn't even uh, come to the arena that night, AJ is going to have to be in there fighting on his own. But I think that that was very respectful, what he said about his dad. And I will tell you as a viewer, it's been strange. I don't know a better word to use. It is strange to watch a fist fight in a silent room. And, I mean, you can hear. There's sound. 
they're gross at times. I don't know mm. how badly I want to hear a guy kicking another guy in his skull. I mean, it, it's just one of these <laughs> real things that, that, that being in the audience and hearing, you can hear these guys grunting. These guys are talking trash back and forth. I didn't know that happened. I didn't know guys actually spoke in the match. You can hear it. And uh, mm. it's a different experience, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think some of the fans actually like that visceral side of it, maybe the more the, blood, the bloodthirsty ones amongst them. What do you think of... Uh, of the step up and, and tell us as a former fighter as you go through the ranks what AJ McKee is going to have at some point in terms of a gut check do we find out more does it reveal all this this coming Thursday night your time Friday morning our time in the UK oh yeah I think it does I mean there continues to be questions uh, McKee's 16 and 0 but he's a young man I mean he, he's had an, an incredible for career for being a young man so he's still got some experiences and us as the viewers still have some questions you know, how is he going to do in a five-round fight and this tournament is all five-round contests. So should he reach that point? Nobody's been able to get out of regulation time with him, let alone into the championship rounds. But what if? How is his condition? How are those intangibles? What's he going to do when his, when his eye is swollen and his nose broken? Is, is he going to fold like a lot of guys? Or is he going to rise and, and try to break your nose right back? And I, I don't offer for you that I would speculate to the answer of this but in all fairness there's a lot of questions and he's going to be locked in there with a former champion of the world this is a tough night out any way you look at it yeah it certainly is Colwell's been very respectful I don't know whether this is kidology or not but he says that uh, the McKee's a complete package he's the, the modern mixed martial arts fighter it, it reminded me of something that Mark Weir spoke to us about obviously an English former UFC fighter saying that it's changed since his time that there's an MMA style now it's not wrestlers against kickboxers there is something that's holistic about young fighters in the sport. Is that something that you witnessed during your career, that perhaps now there's a bespoke MMA fighter as opposed to someone bringing their own discipline into the arena? Sure, sure. I noticed it from the outside. You know, I only left the sport a year ago, but I swear to goodness it's a, it's a new sport than the one I left. Mm. I mean, and to your point, you know, guys are walking into gyms at 12 and 13 and 14 that are called MMA gyms. That wasn't even a thing when I was growing up. You went and did your boxing over here on Monday night, and then you caught a wrestling workout on Tuesday, and you lifted your weights on Wednesday. It's one of these deals, and then two or three times a year, if you could find a match, you try to put it all together. Now, as unorganized as that sounds, your opponent was in the same spot. That's what everyone was doing. Now there's actual gyms where you don't have to have this wrestling background and then try to learn the rest. You can start MMA on day one, and there's only a few guys that do it. I mean, imagine if you're a parent, because you can't compete. You can't compete in MMA until you're 18. So if you're a parent, you're going to take your kid into a practice room knowing you're not going to get to see him compete. In the high schools and the colleges, there's no scholarships. It's one of these rare things. But mm. the few guys who actually did it, now they're coming up. I mean, we got another guy named Amasov who's in Bellator. He's 25 and 0. He has the most impressive record now that Khabib has retired in the entire sport. But mm. he was another one of those guys. He wasn't a jiu-jitsu black belt or a kickboxer turned MMA. He started with MMA, and it's its own sport. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? What about AJ McKee's ambitions? He says that he sees himself taking both the Pitbulls titles, moving up in, in weight as well, not only winning this Grand Prix, but, but then going up. How do you see his future unfolding? Well, I mean, look, he could do it. If anyone's going to do it, and I love a guy – that's got the courage of Babe Ruth, that'll walk onto the plate and tell you where he's going to put the ball. I mean, most guys are scared to do that because it puts a lot of pressure on them. But in all fairness, I do not think that McKee is going to be a 45-pounder for very much longer. Mm. I, you know, he's just too long. He's too big. He lifts and, and works too hard. And he's too young. You and I know, but we don't get smaller with time. We <laughs> get a little bit of weight. So at some point, yes, I do believe he'll be a 55-pounder. To take out both Pitbull brothers – Leave that to AJ. But as far as changing weight classes, I think that's very, very likely. Yeah, I appreciate the compliment. I think your your physique probably changed more uh, more with the muscular variety than the, those of us who are very at, sweet at, 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 atrophying in the media uh, media side of it. Um, what do you think of um, of the potential danger around the knee injury for AJ McKee? Someone like Coldwell, will he try and target that? Sure. I mean, I think so. And, and another question is, uh, you know, how much rehab was AJ doing? I, I, get, I have to go back to the five rounds. It's very relevant because mm. we know that Caldwell can do it. He's done it a number of times. You do have a question around McKee. And then when you start talking about a knee injury, now you're talking about, okay, how long did he train? How hard did he train? Could, it, could he get those miles in to, to get his gas tank full? 
That's speculative at best, but when you're dealing with somebody as good as McKee, you kind of have to look for the critical stuff. The guy's not leaving us as an audience very many uh, questions on what he can and can't do. He is, to Caldwell's point, he's a complete package. Mm, yeah, well, he is. What, what an interesting is about the weight here. Caldwell, former bantamweight champion, and, and Sky Sports, which a lot of people watching this will become from a boxing background because we've covered boxing for, for decades. In boxing around that area, there's a lot closer weight divisions what do you think of Caldwell as a 145 pounder is that his his best weight oh well I, you know I think it's tough I think Caldwell naturally is a, is a little bit smaller when I see him fight at 135 I've never thought he looked like the bigger man out there when I see him fight at 145 I've thought a couple of times well he's he's a little bit small but he moves so well he's such a veteran he understands angles and positions even if a guy's stronger he understands to get an underhook he understands where his head goes he starts to wear those guys down and I've never thought that Caldwell has a conditioning problem, but I think he thinks so. I, I think Caldwell, the longer the night goes, I don't think he likes it as much. And I, and I do think with some of those guys that he can move around and he doesn't have to put the quite the taxing on his body to beat the scale the night before. He looks a little bit fresher at 145. Yeah, he's the, the older man in there, isn't he, as well? Two southpaws in, in the stance. But do you expect Caldwell to try and take him down? What do you think his tactics will be? I think he needs to try to take him down. And please please hear what I'm saying. He does not have to get him down. He needs to try to take him down. What I'm talking about is Caldwell needs to offer the threat. McKee mm. respects wrestling. McKee's old man is a wrestler and a wrestling coach. Caldwell is the national champion, the highest level you can reach in America. And he won the whole damn thing. Now, I only bring that to you because McKee knows this. And Caldwell needs to make sure that he gets his respect. If he can start getting respect, making McKee worry about the, just the threat of the mm. take, that's when the hands open up. But if, if Caldwell tries to box, then wrestle, that's not what we're doing here. It's boxing and mm. wrestling. MMA, he's got to do them both together. So you're, fainting, you're not only fainting punches and kicks, but you're fainting takedowns as well. That's all part yes. of the, the rich tapestry, isn't it? That's exactly right. He needs to make sure he gets that respect. He needs, he needs McKee to worry and wonder for five straight rounds, is he going to try to take me down and do I have to worry about it? He just needs the threat. He doesn't have to get on top of him, but he's got to threaten it. Mm. Uh, let's move on to, oh, actually, get your prediction first of all. What do you think your prediction for the main event is for this one? Okay, I, I, think, that McKee, I think that McKee is going to win this fight. Look, there are some questions as the ones that I laid out for you. The five-round club, how well is that knee? Where's the gas tank? I think those are very legitimate questions. I just think that he's going to pass those tests. I think it's going to be a hard fight, though. I think it's probably the hardest fight that McKee has ever had. And, uh, you know, there is a part of me that wonders, does, does AJ respect Darren Caldwell, does he understand how, how big of a threat this is? Because Caldwell's going to perform. That much I can tell you. This is just the kind of match that Caldwell shows up for. He's going to show up. Oh, I look forward, look forward to seeing that. But it's a fascinating card all round as well. The co-main event. And I suppose for a lot of people who may be quote-unquote casual MMA fans, Benson Henderson may be the name that resonates from that when they look at, look at that. But it's up against Jason Jackson in the welterweight uh, fight. What do you make of Benson Henderson just turned... 37, who was one and three early in his Bellator career, but then went on a winning streak, lost, of course, to, to Michael Chandler. Whereabouts is he in his career? Is this a kind of crossroads time for him? I will tell you this. If you go look at Benson's record and only the record, you don't watch the fights, you're going to have a very deceptive opinion of where he's at. I mean, even if we're to go back to his last match with Chandler, he came mm. out, he did everything right. He took a punch that would have put down a mule. Nobody could have taken that shot. It, it happened to land, and, and so we all get up and go home. Benson Henderson's a very scary guy, and he also loves to compete. I mean, he, he's on a pursuit right now. He's already been the MMA world champion. He's on a pursuit to be the jiu-jitsu world champion. Now, why that is his goal, I don't know, but he's working <laughs> his butt off at doing it. I mean, he's going and entering competitions uh, on the weekend, getting mm. these hard goes, shaking hands. I mean, the guy's in great shape. He takes his shirt off. He looks like he's carved out of stone. I would never, ever underestimate Benson Henderson. That, that I will tell you. Good stuff. Well, how, how is that, though, to be focusing on solely on one discipline like jiu-jitsu and then trying to throw it all together in the pot? Well, it's such a great – it's so great for your cardio above everything else. You know, wrestling and pushing and pulling and breathing hard and trying to get a position on the guy nonstop. It's one of those things that it just creates for a very unique conditioning. And that's the thing that I like about it when I see that Benson's doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's, he's had mixed results at it. But I, the mere fact that he's out there and he's breathing that hard, he's going with these 18 and 19 and 23-year-old guys, and he's keeping up with them at 37 years old. I mean, that's a great way to stay young. I was there when Randy Couture went on his run all the way to 47 years old, captured his last championship at 44. 
And one of the things that Randy always did is he trained with the kids. He would go into the high schools and he would make sure that that next generation never caught him to pass him up. He would always stay current and fluent by going with the younger guys. I see Benson do it. I think it's one of the reasons he's extended his career. Yeah, I guess it makes you feel young to be around the young people as well. The weight conflict with him, if there is a conflict, he says he wants to fight at 155. Seeing him here at 170, he says he doesn't have to watch his calories, which is, which is good in the, in the build-up. But how do you see him and where he fits in? Because 15 pounds is a significant difference, isn't it? Most definitely. Now, I think his speed is going to be a little bit better, and I think his cardio will be better. That's just good, solid logic, right? If you're carrying mm. around less than the other guy, you can probably move faster a little longer than he can. But he doesn't want to get pinned up either. Uh, size really does matter. There's a reason that we have the way. And if a guy gets on top of you and you've got to carry that weight, that can drain the battery. So I think there's some positions that Benson's going to want to be in. I do wonder uh, what his confidence level is on his feet right now. We, we see this a lot, particularly with boxers, but MMA is guilty as well. When you go and get knocked out and, you know, Benson mm -hmm. really opened up, he was going for the kill himself, but that allowed him uh, to be put down. If, if, if he's apprehensive on his feet, that's going to be a big negative. I think that's the mental challenge that he personally has to deal with in this contest. Yeah, and, and a technical challenge. You mentioned boxing. Jason Jackson of, of Jamaican Heritage got that win over Jordan uh, Mayan, and he's got, he's got a reach of 78 inches. I suppose the question is, can he use that reach in the uh, cage? Yeah, no, that's always the question. You know, you'll always talk about that. Can I keep him at the end of my punches or their strategy? Well, I need to keep him at the end of his punches. That man, that's easy stuff to say. You know how hard that is to do. I got to go all the way back to Tom <laughs> Hitman Hearns in 1989 for a guy with a reach that actually knew how to use it. Most of those guys don't know how to use their reach. It's just one of those hard things to do. I mean, there's a lot of geometry. There's a lot of calculus going on to, to get to something and keep them at the end of it. So I think in theory, the reach advantage is a fun thing to say. I've never seen a guy with long arms that happens to go win a bunch of championships because of it. I'm not sure that reach is an mm. advantage. You tell Mike Tyson that you need a reach advantage. I'm like, <laughs> this is silly. Yeah, the danger with Tyson, and I suppose uh, the opponent, obviously Henderson, will be thinking once you get inside the reach, if the, if the fighter with a longer reach isn't able to fight inside, then it becomes a different different fight. It can work against them, can't it? Sure. No, I, full, I fully agree with you, and I think that's what Benson's going to do. I think he's going to be very grappling heavy. And, and don't forget, mm. grappling doesn't mean he has to get him down. He just has to get to him. You can grapple on your feet, but go back to Randy Couture, but he made that dirty boxing famous. Look at mm. Daniel Cormier, but he'll get, a, he'll get a guy with an underhook, push him into the fence, and slow him down. That's wrestling, even though he's not on top. And I think Benson's going to do a lot of that. I think he's going to make it grindy. How, how do you see that one going? I, look, I think that Benson's – I think this is a good match for him. I, I really think that even with the weight – I like that he's at 170. I hope he tries 170. I'm personalizing. I did it later in my career. But it also did allow me to extend my career. You know, mm. beating the scale is such a hard fight that nobody sees. And it takes so much out of you. That for Benson Henderson to be able to put that aside – you know, he was talking about the calories. But that's a real thing. When you're trying to train hard – and not giving, not not putting, uh, you know, gas into the car. It's it, it's hard. I, I like that he's at one seventy. I hope he feels rejuvenated. Is that is that why you have to be just, um, I guess, present in your body at the time to realize where you're at, rather than sticking with a weight and thinking this is me. It's it's an ongoing process to, to see how you are. Because as you say, you you tend to thicken up as you get older naturally. Yeah, that's right. And I'll tell you, a lot of guys from Benston's past have changed weights too. Frankie Edgar actually went down in weight. Nate Diaz, by example, went up in weight. So I think this is a common thing. And I can tell you that Benson isn't going to be overwhelmed by the size. He has plenty mm. of guys in the practice room that are this weight. He's known about this for a period of time. And the fact that he just got knocked out, I'm glad he wasn't taxing his body and going back to 55. I like the weight. I don't know that Benson would agree with me. I think that Benson's a little apprehensive about it. I'm just, my prediction is when this whole thing's done, he's going to look back and go, wow, I like 170. Brilliant. Well, let's uh, we'll look forward to, to how he works out at 170 uh, in this uh, installment. wanted to ask you quickly about another unbeaten record on the line. Joey Davis, who I believe is, is part of the McKee setup as well, taking on Bobby Lee in Lee's Bellator debut. How much are you looking forward to this one? Well, Davis is special. Uh, give you a little backstory on Davis. He was a Division II wrestler, but he won that damn thing four times. Uh, he won freshman, <laughs> sophomore, junior, senior. He won them all. And I don't think he lost a match. I think he was an undefeated uh, four-time champion. So very explosive but he's also gotten very good with his hands. He's had natural hips. That comes from the wrestling background. He's very good at getting control. That's the wrestling background. But what's been, been a real surprise is how explosive he is with his mm. hands, particularly in the ground and pound. He'll get a guy down, you know, no body, body, head, no, excuse me. He sits up, boom, boom, and mm. he's looking 
he's looking to do damage. And when you have a guy like that and you get some footage, you know, it's very scary. Anybody that's going to fight Davis needs to get to the second and third round. Because that mm. first round, there's going to be a storm. And most guys, there's, there's nobody left stand-up. When you go in there from a wrestling background, is it a liberating feeling in a way that you can unleash those fists on the ground in the ground and pound? Yeah, it's something that you have to practice. And we see some guys where their learning curve is different. I've just been so, so surprised at how fast it was for Davis. I mean, this guy was a natural. And we knew he was in shape, and we knew we knew how to compete. Again, that, that came from his amateur days. But it's still a different sport. You know, wrestling where a guy's trying to score points on you against fighting where a guy is trying to hurt you, it's a different sport. And I, I was really surprised with his mentality. I was surprised at how composed he has been. And by the way, I'm not taking away from Lee, but in fairness, Davis is the favorite, and it's for a reason. Mm, something instinctive about it. Well, Chael, fantastic to speak to you. You're looking forward to it Thursday night? You're in the, the zone, the rhythm now of, of 2020, the pandemic MMA? I will tell you, I'm pumped, man. I get a little bit of a high from the fight still. I, 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 you know, I've seen so many cage fights. I still get a little bit of a high, man. It's, it's like Christmas for me when I was a kid. I love it. I love fight week. I got a quarantine. Not looking forward to quarantine because it's boring and the food's terrible and there's nothing new on Netflix. If you have a suggestion, tell me now because I could really use it. Jerry Seinfeld, Coffee with Comedians is good. And I think there's about 100 of them. I I'm, and, you know what? and I've been watching them. I've been, yeah. See, that's the problem. I'm telling you, I've seen everything. I've seen yeah. everything. I like the Eddie Murphy one. and the, Ricky Gervais has done a couple of good ones on there, but there's, there's some good ones. But yeah, you, you've been prolific in, in what you're watching. But it'd be fantastic to speak to you. Ricky, we look hey, forward to... Hey, Ricky Gervais is a genius, by the way. That's a, he's a very brilliant mind. Yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> some interesting conversations they had on, the, on that program as well. But... Chael, we appreciate your time. Look forward to your analysis as well as, as we're you know, watching I feel, I feel like you're really, you're really rushing me. I'm like, well, what's the big hurry? What is it you have to do? You know, here's your hat. What's your hurry, Chael? Tell your story, Walk. Yeah, I feel like you've been trying to get off this call <laughs> for a couple of minutes now. Not at all. Not at all. It's good to speak to you. I know you're usually the guy that makes the sharp exit, but maybe now you're in quarantine. You're just enjoying a bit of, uh, bit of conversation. That's right. I'll tell you, I'm actually in New York. I'll give you a quick view. I'm in New York. I'm going to get outside. And my son and I are going to go to Times Square. We're in search of the Hulk. The Green Hulk is down in Times Square somewhere. We went the other really? day to find him. Ran into some, some guy. He calls himself the Naked Cowboy. Oh, yeah, yeah. News, newsflash, he's a cowboy and he's naked. So um, <laughs> hopefully I find the Hulk today. I'll let how you old, know how that goes. Good man. How old's your son, by the way? Five years old. Oh, okay. So that was a bit of a shock, a naked cowboy in New York. So it's a, a new bit, experience. Well, you know, I've, I've heard of the Naked Cowboy, but he is naked. He is holding a guitar and nothing. <laughs> and how, how is New York? Because we hear in the UK that it's sort of Armageddon over there, post-apocalyptic after, okay. after the pandemic and the election and everything. Well, okay, so they thought all heck was going to break loose on the election. They boarded the whole city up, police everywhere, and it never happened. So the streets are pretty clear. Everything's open. If you want a table at a restaurant, walk right in. If you want to buy something at a store, go right to the front of the line. So in that regard, New York has been a, a very pleasant uh, time to be here because it, it, they're just the population's down. You can kind of move around a little bit. I'm having a great time. That's my answer. I got to go find the Hulk, though. If I find the Hulk, boom, <laughs> home run. No Hulk, I'm probably going to have a bad day. There you go. I know you get bored eventually. So we've, we've had a good chat. I really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the oh, week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had it with you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> good man. Well, fantastic to speak to Charles Sonnen as he heads out to New York before heading up to the Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut for Bellator 253, which you can watch live on Sky Sports in the early hours of Friday morning. For more MMA content, head to skysports.com and we'll be back again soon. Goodbye for now.